scripture reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 6. <coughs> if you would, would you join me as I stand, as we stand in? So we can read, and we will read chapter verse, verses 6 to 8, and I would like you to join me from verses 9 to 12. Matthew, chapter 6. have need of before you ask him. Together? After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Yeah. 
Well, good morning. good morning. There's much to be covered. And I'm going to borrow this. I'm going to be relaxed. I want you to relax too a little bit. Uh, I used to do this at home. So with your permission, I'll do it here. There, there have been uh, many blessings this morning already and uh, I hope that these will continue uh, I can trust the Holy Spirit can you? Ah. indeed there, there were uh, uh, I, uh, my memory is not what it used to be and uh, there I can't even remember where I wrote my notes down. Uh, during Sabbath school, I was listening intently. And uh, it was a good lesson. But I wrote some notes down. The first one was uh, lonely? Come to Avon Park. <laughs> No, the reality is, our churches, it's a, it's a systemic issue that we have. And that issue is, uh, in church, we're generally kind of friendly. But when somebody doesn't appear in church for a week, two, three, we're reluctant to contact them. Uh, and not all of us, but uh, let me put it this way. There is no reason why, if somebody's missing, even if you know where they are, okay, to give them a call during the week and say, how was your trip? Or I'm sorry you had a cold. How are you feeling now? That's all you have to do. Just make contact. We had a fellow back in my home church in Jamestown, New York, where Bob and Dina Milk are from. It wasn't Bob and Dina Milk. They moved here. They didn't miss out on church. They immediately joined here. Happy birthday! And Levi, where's Levi? Is he here? Oh, okay. Happy birthday. Boy, we've got a bunch of them. Uh, do you ever sing happy birthday? No, you don't? Okay. Uh, well, uh, very honestly, some, some churches, they're kind of reluctant to bring in something like that. Uh, but happy birthday, both of you. Uh, Levi, how old are you? 
almost 19. Well, Bob is only uh, 60 years ahead of you. So I'm, I'm uh, 50 years ahead of you. So congratulations, both. Bob turned 89, turns 89 today. Yeah. I, w I would love to uh, take the time to bring Bob up here and do a little interview with him, reminisce a little bit about uh, Jamestown. You want to do that? Just uh, like three minutes? Come on. Come on. You can, you can, if you struggle, you can make it this far. And we'll, we'll need another mic. <clears throat> Bob, Bob and I go back uh, probably 50 years. At least. <laughs> Bob, uh, Bob had a, a shop up on uh, the Gary Sinclairville Road, Route, Route 60, going up, uh, going up towards Sinclairville. And uh, he worked on all kinds of cars, loved hot rods. And I remember, I remember one that he uh, uh, had some kind of uh, Jim Polaro's little, little 39 Ford. Yeah. Well, and tell me a little bit about that. Well, I, I mean, don't go too, don't go all day, but uh, lift that mic up and. It had a 286 cubic inch uh, flathead Ford in it. Mm -hmm. That would be bored out three and three eighths by four. And with a three you, you understand what he's saying, though, right? <laughs> With a 371 GMC blower. <laughs> that did the trick. Yeah. Well, Shave with it. he lost first gear, but he raced it at the drag strip second and high. And when it started to get by him, he shoved it back into second gear, but he won. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. That, that little thing, I remember it because it was, as I recall, light blue. And it had a flame yeah. painted on the front end, yeah, right? Somebody painted flames on it. Yeah, never burned up though. No. Yeah, no. yeah. The, I I remember another story. Whether it's uh, anecdotal or not, you can you can verify. He was in a place uh, imbibing a little bit, you know, and somebody came in with a Hudson, and he says, "I'll race anybody in here," and he threw his keys on the on the the bar. And uh, Jim Polero said, uh, well, I thought I'd better pick him up before anybody else did. So, so he, he went out and on the, the 62 out there or wherever it was, uh, they ran off and raced. And the poor guy with the Hudson was left in the dust. <laughs> did, did he keep, did Polero keep the, the no, keys? No, he, he gave it he back. Gave it back. Well, it's, that I, I figured he probably He was would. a good guy. Yeah, he, Jim Polero was a good guy. Now, I, I, don't, I don't just want to talk about hot rods. I know there's many more. He put a, he put a Hemi in a Corvair, and I think it's still sitting behind your... Yeah, it's in uh, my backyard. Yeah, well, someday maybe you'll run it again. Uh, Bob and I and Jim Warner were all instrumental in starting a radio station in New York. And, oh, we had a lot of fun with that thing. We put, it, we put a dish up on the roof of the building I had my office in, where we also put the studio. And we all worked together putting that dis dish up, and we had a drill drilling into the parapet wall. And uh, we finally put the dish up. That night, a storm came through and blew the dish down. <laughs> And it was cabled in, so it, it went down almost to the ground, but not far enough from the ground, so it hit a Lincoln on the roof. <laughs> and we, we, uh, we had to pay for fixing, fixing that Lincoln. But uh, our radio station, Bob, Bob made programs, many, many programs, called Uncle Bob's Street Corner Ministries. Do you remember the story about the cowboy, the old cowboy? Don't think so. Though. Don't think so. The, the, old, the old cowboy, you don't remember that? No, oh, do you remember any of your old stories? Well. I, I know you're 89. 
<laughs> Probably none that I can tell here. <laughs> well, the, uh, I remember the old cowboy. The old cowboy came to church, and he was dressed up in his cowboy hat, clean jeans, and the, the minister did his sermon, and then he said, when he came through line, he said to the old cowboy, he said, uh, I, th I think before you come back to this church, you were pretty fancy here, we've got a million dollar organ and so forth, uh, I would appreciate it, and I think the Lord would appreciate it if you contacted him to see how you should dress before you come to this place. So he says, well, I'll do that. And he goes out, and the next week he comes back, cowboy hat, clean jeans, shirt, clean, pressed. And uh, this time the pastor came right down off the platform. And he walked up to him and he says, I thought I told you to ask the Lord what kind of dress, what kind of attire is appropriate for this church. And he says, yes, sir. He says, well, did you do that? Yes, sir. Well, what did he say? He said he wouldn't have any idea. He'd never been there. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, Bob Street Corner Ministries uh, had a lot of those things. And they, they, they all had a little punchline, but they all had a moral to the story. And very honestly, it was one of our most popular uh, programs that were made uh, locally. So uh, we appreciate all those things. They're still up there. Whether they, they aren't playing them now because they don't know how to get them on. But we're, <laughs> Maybe we're, that's a good thing. <laughs> no, it's not, no, it's not a good thing. Did you ever, ever, uh, were you ever disappointed that you moved down here? No. Ah. No. See? Uh, my sentiments exactly. No. Uh, yeah. I remember the good old days with the snow every day, mm -hmm. but it's like the cast I had on my leg. I missed it when it was gone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. We uh, want to thank you for just sharing a little bit, and again, happy birthday. Well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I hope I'm here for one next year, too. It, that's absolutely. I told somebody when mine came around, it was, it was so good this time that I think I'll have another one next year. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bob. Thanks, Bob. We've appreciated Bob. I used to take my car to him uh, to be repaired. And uh, he doesn't do much repairs now. And... Uh, uh, I think if you twisted his arm, he'd probably do it for you, uh, as long as it's not changing an engine. He might even tackle that. I don't, that's the kind of stuff he'd like to do. But he, he told me this morning, he says, oh, I still do a little bit, but it uh, takes me a little longer. <laughs> and I can understand that, because I go out to water my flowers, and I water two or three baskets, and then I have to sit down and rest and wipe my forehead, and then go, go, go do a few more and I have trouble standing up. And part of that is, uh, is that uh, my eyes and my uh, muscles are affected by the disease I have. And there are, I think there are about 100 billion cells in our bodies, something like that, I can't remember. We have a tremendous creator. And uh, about uh, a million or two cells uh, aren't working very good in my eyes. And then down my neck and back, there are about uh, uh, 900 or 9 million cells, 90 million cells or something like that, that uh, aren't working very well. And then my fingers and my arms, oh, I had a, a patch of shingles in my arm. I'm going through, any medical people here today? Post-herpatic syndrome. It's the pain that's left after the shingles are gone and nobody can do anything about it. I'm taking the meds that they recommend, but they, all they do is make me sleepy. <laughs> but uh, the rest of the 999 billion cells, uh, they don't work very good either. So, uh, one, one thing, another thing here, uh, I wanted to underscore you didn't say it this way, but you had it in here. If Jesus is in, Jesus comes out. Hmm? Is that right? Yes. If Jesus is in, Jesus comes out. 
And then there was a little quotation from Robin Williams. How many of you know Robin Williams? Oh, okay, all you young people do. Robin Williams was a, an uncouth comedian. I mean, he never, he never spoke 10 words with any decent meaning to them, except once. And this is what he said. I, I did it from memory. I hope it's right. Robin Williams. I used to think nothing was worse than being alone. Now I recognize, uh, let's see, now, boy, I wish I could read my own writing. <laughs> now, um, I realize that it's worse to be with people that make you feel alone. Well, that's enough of my commentary on the lesson. Uh, good lesson this morning. It was, I, I noticed that, that you have good discussions. That's, uh, that's what, that's what uh, our class does too. We would rather have discussions than lectures. However, Elder Brown, who is 95, <laughs> got us beat, Bob. Uh, he's 95 years old. He still teaches the main class in the sanctuary at Avon Park. And if you've ever been there, you recognize that Avon Park is a rather large church. And there are times when his class is two to 300 people. And uh, you don't uh, throw that open for discussion. <laughs> it becomes, a, it becomes a, a zoo if you do. In fact, if, if you have a discussion class uh, with most of our people today, the teacher can ask any given question in such a way as to start a fight. And we don't want to start fights. It was about 60 years ago. Well, no, no, see, uh, it, it was about 30 years ago, and I was asked to preach in my home church, and I was all ready. Thursday night, I went to bed, and I thought, well, Friday I'll get up and review it again, then Friday night I'll review it again. And I, I, I went to bed that night. And about three o'clock in the morning, I was awakened. And I had three texts going through my mind. Couldn't shake them. And I said, okay, Lord, you woke me up. You put these texts here. So we're going to use them Sabbath morning. And I, I did, I used these three texts that we're going to use today. And there was a young man there that had, uh, was in the process of going through a divorce. There's a redundancy for you. He was going through a divorce. It was uh, like most divorces. It was rather bitter. And nobody will leave the, the couple alone. They take sides. Is that true? Oh, hello? Isn't that true? We can't stand to sit back and just watch them go because we want to help. Sometimes we help. Usually, we don't. We don't. Because we take sides. Well, when I got done with the sermon that day, the young man was standing at the back wall waiting for the reception line. And he came over with tears. Not just in his eyes, but tears running down his cheeks and wiping his eyes. 
and I said, what's the matter? He says, oh boy, did I need that today. Well, all I could do was say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I suppose that if you're an inquisitive type, you might say, well, what were the three texts? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, the first one is found in 1 John. And it's a very familiar text. But we're going to look at it in context, which will help us understand where we're going. It's 1 John 1, 9. What does it say? If we confess our sins, plural, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse from almost all of our unrighteousness. All, all of our unrighteousness. Are you, are you glad for that? Oh. Where, where would you be were that not so? I, there's a song. By the way, uh, Daphne? Where's Daphne? Ah, thank you. Thank you for that song. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, uh, Daphne must be 39. <laughs> What's that? Oh, 88? Oh. Oh, praise the Lord. And she sings. And she sings on key. And she sings well. Uh, thank you for that song. Now, where was I? Uh, we're going to look at this in context. Uh, starting with verse 5. Let's, let's take a look there. And there, there, there is a theme in these uh, first uh, three verses, 5, 6, and 7. Or maybe 5 and 6. I guess it's 5 and 6. That's a, I don't know linguistically what it would be called, but I call it an, an opposing premise. Let's look at verse 5. This, then, is the message which we have heard from him, from Jesus, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness. Do you see the opposing premise? God is light and in him there is no darkness. Uh, if you have a totally dark room and you strike a match, is it totally dark? No. Is it some dark? Well, dark is dark is dark, right? And I remember somebody I think it was Jose Rojas. You know, I, you know Rosa, uh, Jose? I don't know Jose Rojas. Oh, yeah, okay. Young people know Jose Rojas. Rojas, Rojas was at our camp meeting one time, and he said uh, he was preaching on, on Jesus, the light of the world. And he said, he said, light? And darkness, I'm trying to be like him, cannot, cannot occupy the same place at the same time. Right? Why don't you stop and think about that? That's what John is saying. In him is light, and, or he is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, that's a good thing to remember now. Verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him who is light and walk in darkness, we're lying. Hmm. And what does it say? And do not the truth. That reminds me of a, a text way back in the Old Testament where a lot of people don't like to go. But uh, very honestly, if you don't go to the Old Testament, you don't understand what the New Testament is saying. But there's a verse back there in Isaiah 8, verse 20. That's a key text. 
What does it say? To the law and to the testimony. What is the law and the testimony? Yeah. The whole thing, right? The law and the testimony. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there isn't very much light in them. It, huh? There, there is no light in them. Oh, I've, I've, I've heard the arguments. I've, I've heard them all. I've heard the arguments that say, well, what that means is when he's saying something that isn't true, there's no light in what he's saying at that time. Uh, you can buy that if you want to. I don't. Uh, because if you're traveling down the highway and uh, somebody has told you how to get to Orlando, that's an easy one. Uh, they tell you, go north on uh, uh, 27 until you get to 1794, 92, 1792, get to 1792 and go to Orlando. Well, if you stay on 1792, you will go through a lot of towns. And if you make any wrong turns, will you get to Orlando? I usually use Dallas, Texas. It's easier, but it takes longer. Uh, it's further away. But in Dallas, if, you, if you're taking I-30 or I-40, which, whichever one it is, and you go to Tulsa, and uh, they say, then you say, well, just turn there and go to Dallas. How, which, what road do I turn on? And uh, most everybody knows it's 35. But if we don't turn on 35, 40 will take you all the way to California. And that doesn't help us at all. So if, if, there, if there is no light in them, don't follow them. Don't follow them. There's a great preacher. He owns a big uh, church uh, in California. And uh, that church has thousands of members. And all the Adventist preachers and all the Adventist uh, leaders would love to have a church like that. And he preaches good sermons. Love, peace, comfort, and doing your duty. But there's a lot of stuff he leaves out. How many want to follow him? Hmm. Nobody? But it's good stuff. Be kind to your neighbor. Love everyone. But the stuff that he leaves out is critical. Hmm? Now we're almost there. Verse 7. If, I'm, I'm a little afraid to take my glasses off. I read better with my glasses off, but I can't see anything anyway. This thing, um, I, I used to be kidded because I had big ears. I could use bigger ears today. Because this, this goes behind your ear, you know, and uh, it fell off while I was doing something up here. I was trying to put it back on. The buffer fell off then. I couldn't see the buffer, how to put a buffer back on. I know there's a little hole in it. I had my friend here put the buffer back on for me. And so, uh, where was I? Verse 7. Was it verse 7? Yes. Verse 7. But if we... Oh, I know where I was. Can't see anything. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship one with another. And the blood, blood of Christ, Jesus Christ, his son, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. However, I put that in there because it 
kind of fits. However, he says, John says, if we say we have no sin, singular, and uh, by the way, if we say that we have no sin, that's present tense, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But, I put that in too, if we confess our sin, plural, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, plural, and to cleanse us, oh, this is critical, from all unrighteousness. What's the operative word in that whole text? If we you're whispering if we confess our sin he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John doesn't end there but we're going to have to end there because uh, my time is limited, if not by you folks, by my stamina. There, if you go on, this same theme carries on through chapter 2 and I think it's verse 11. But uh, just, uh, just read, read the rest of it. There's, there's another verse, verse 10. If we say we have not sinned in the past... We make him a liar, and the word is not in us, and his word is not in us. Why does he make us a liar? Or does it make us a liar? Because Paul has taught us all, hmm, yeah, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Then comes verse 2, which I'm not going to read. But you can read that and tear it apart word by word. Ask yourself questions. Do some uh, expository studying. Uh, you know what expository studying is? It's exposing, pulling out the truths that are in a specific text or a group of texts. Expository study. Do some expository study. The next text that we wanted to look at is uh, Matthew, the sixth chapter, which uh, part of what we read this morning and uh, you understand where this comes from, I'm sure. It's the, uh, Jesus' response to a question from the disciples. How do you pray the way you do? Huh? Can, you, can you show us how to pray? That he said, yes, do this. Uh, I, I've, I have put myself in the disciples' place or in Jesus' place um, sometimes. And I think, um, what would Jesus have done here? Why was he giving them this prayer? Was it for them to memorize and repeat? Yes? No. No, it wasn't. It was, he said, when you pray, pray like this, right? Now, having said that, is there anything wrong with repeating the Lord's Prayer? I remember when I was growing up, we'd be in church and the pastor, or the elder would be up there uh, doing the morning prayer. And he would uh, do the whole nine yards, bless the call porters and the ministers around the world, bless those in dark, deepest Africa, and bless those in Cuba, and bless those in South America. How about the ones in America? Well, they're all right. But uh, he, he, the, the, he, would, he would go on, and then he would say a little blurb. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, right? And then somebody picked up on that one time, and they said, well, you know, uh, I pray, and, and then I do the Lord's Prayer, a perfect prayer, just in case I've missed something. Well, anyway, 
Afterward, after the, the prayer that Jesus prayed, uh, well, I've got to stop there. I've got to go into the middle of it. It's, he said, give us this day our daily bread. Then he said in verse 12, and forgive us. What's, what's the name of the, the title of the sermon today? Forgiveness, forgiveness 101. If, what's it say? And forgive us. That's what I thought it was. It was. And forgive us our debts. Oh, yeah, okay. Boy, this congregation loves to whisper. <laughs> and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who... Well, that's, that's the Catholic version. We can't use that. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Same difference. Jesus later on, in I think it was Matthew 18, uh, told a story. He had just given us the, 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 the counsel on how to take care of an issue you have with your brother in chapter 18 of Matthew. In that chapter, he says, if, if you have something against your brother, go to him and ask him to forgive you and discuss it and try to clear it up. If he won't hear you, take two others with you that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything can be accounted for. If they won't hear the three of you, take it to the church. If they won't, if he won't hear the church, well, what he, what he, what he says is don't have anything to do with them. Now, there are some who are euphemizing that text also. They're saying, well, what that means is, if you have a, a heathen man, which that's actually the King James uh, verbiage, if you have a heathen man, what do you do with him? Well, they say, you go out and try to win him. But Jesus says, in Matthew 18, if he won't hear the church after you have gone to him, after you've taken two witnesses with you and he still doesn't hear you and you take it to the church, count this man as a heathen man. Paul, in a parallel verse, and I can't remember where it is, he says, leave him alone. Have nothing to do with him. That's hard for us to do because we're very good at plowing ground. Hmm? Isn't that right? We plow the ground and then we go out and plow it again and plow it again. We've been plowing ground for 160 some years, still plowing ground. I think it's about time we disked it and dragged it, fertilized it. And what's the next thing? plant seeds once you've planted the seeds the last place you want to plow is in your field hmm? I used to be a farmer uh, sometimes it shows up in my language uh, I used to be a farmer and that's one thing you didn't do uh, there was a, a little guy by the name of Glenn Kuhn Oh, yeah, okay, quite a few of them. Uh, remember Glenn Coon? He was a New Yorker, lived out in a country, little tiny church. I mean, it could have been a little house church. They could have gathered everybody on the front porch. That's where Glenn started. And he said, I, I started a garden one time, and I planted some beans, and I went out, and, and uh, sure enough, there was that little bean sprout coming up. And so I reached down and pulled on it to make it a little bit longer. <laughs> well, that's logic, isn't it? So you pull on it, and the next day he went out and it didn't look very good, so he pulled on it again. And he says, it didn't take too long for me to realize that I didn't know beans about beans. 
and that's the truth. But uh, Jesus then, uh, after his discussion about the uh, uh, council uh, taking care of issues in the church, then he goes on to a parable about a very wealthy man who had servants. And one of his servants, after he had taken account, one of his servants was called in and said, uh, you owe me seven and a half million dollars. That's, uh, what's the term I want now? Uh, that's, that's in today's money. Seven and a half million dollars. And the guy's a servant. He says, I, I don't have seven and a half million dollars. Please, wait, give me time and I'll pay you everything. And the guy, the, the rich guy says, I didn't, I knew he didn't have the money and I knew he couldn't pay it. He could work for me for the rest of his life and he still couldn't pay it. So he says, I forgive it. I'll forgive you the whole thing. Go in peace. So he goes out and uh, the rest of the story is he goes out and finds a man who owed him the equivalent of $1,500. Well, it sounds like a lot of money, but in comparison, it was a mere pittance. So he grabbed him by the throat and says, pay me everything or I'll put you in prison until you can. The guy says, please, I don't have it. There's no way I can raise it. Please, please give me time and I'll give you everything. But he grabbed him by the throat and dragged him off to prison. He and his wife and his children put them into servitude. Well, it just happened that another servant, a third, saw this go on and went to the master and told him about it. And the master was irate. And he called this first servant in and he says, why did you do this? Why didn't you have compassion on him as I had compassion on you? And he pulled his grace away from him and he sent him to prison until he could pay it all. I don't remember if uh, this is one of the places Jesus, says, Jesus said, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the principle's there. You understand it. This is something now that we want to cover here. This second verse is, uh, is verse uh, uh, 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will my heavenly Father forgive you. God, what are you doing? You're not being fair here. That just because I can't forgive him, you're not going to forgive me? And God in his big deep voice says, no, it's not that I won't forgive you. I can't. Hmm. Well, Kelly, what do you mean by that? Hmm. Well, let's look at it this way. What, what, what was said in John, 1 John 1, 9 again? If, all oh, these whisperers. <laughs> if we confess our sin, I, I know I have this voice, I, I can't help it. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive. Hmm? What's the prerequisite to forgiveness? Confession. If we confess our sin. If we hold on to that sin, how much other sin can he forgive us? That becomes an issue, doesn't it? Well, we might say, well, we can forgive or ask confession or ask, ask forgiveness one at a time, can't we? And then keep the rest until 
Give me a break. I got something written here. Yeah, here it is. This is from Testimonies, Volume 5. Yeah, are you okay with Mrs. White? Amen. Amen. This is from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 53. Even one wrong trait of character, even one wrong trait of character, one sinful desire cherished will eventually neutralize all the power of the gospel. Did, did you hear that? It's pretty potent. I mean, what right has she got to tell us that? It's truth. And there's an operative word in here again. It's so important. I'm going to lay this down again and go off on another rabbit trail. It's so important when we're studying to read what's written. Oh, I almost got that thing again. Uh, Judge Scalia. Uh, you remember him. He was uh, murdered. But we won't talk about that. He, he died uh, some, some a couple of years ago on a hunting trip. After he'd been out there hunting all day, and he came in and had a light supper and went to bed, never moved. Huh, that's interesting. Uh, anyway, Judge Scalia said something like this. In the Constitution and the Bible, there's one principle that we should follow, that we should understand. It says what it says and doesn't say what it doesn't say. Well, he's smarter than I am, and he's the one who wrote it. And I, I began, after a couple of years studying it, I began to understand what he was saying. It says what it says and doesn't say what it doesn't say. And oh boy, are they applying the opposite to the Constitution nowadays. Uh, you, yeah, you know about that. Now where was I? Read in the Bible when you're studying. Read what it says. Read the words. What do, if, you, if you come across the word like propitiation, ask yourself, what does propitiation mean? I could go on that rabbit trail too. Next time. Next time. Read what it says. Uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In chapter 9, I've got to build this bridge again. In chapter, uh, verse 9 of John, if we confess our sin, he is uh, faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This verse now, God says, Jesus says, if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will I forgive your trespasses. Not because he won't, but because he can't. Because you're holding on to all the animosity where your friend has wronged you. And he can't overcome that unless you confess it as wrong. As sin in your life. Once you confess that too, then you go to him and say, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. In that I have hated my brother, my sister. Hmm? Then, if we confess, he forgives all, cleanses all. There is a third one that I came up with that night, and I praise the Lord for it. 
all of these. It's in Philippians, the third chapter, verses 13 and 14. Let me see if I can find Philippians. Oh, I know I'm being funny here. I know where it is. It's just that I can't find it. Uh, chapter 3, and uh, to get the context here, uh, there, there's only one line that was uh, going through my head that, that early morning, but just to get the, get the uh, context, I'm going to start with verse 9, and this is what it says, and be found in him, oh there's much more we could throw in here, and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Oh, boy, could we go with that one. That I may know him and the power of his what? I, I thought that's what it said. I wasn't sure with my eyes here. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto what? The resurrection again. Remember that, because it comes up in a couple of minutes. Uh, attain to the resurrection of the dead. Verse 12. Not as though I had already attained to what? I knew somebody would say that. Don't know where it came from. I'm not going to accuse anybody. But if we're understanding the, the, the text, it's I have not already attained to the resurrection. I don't, in other words, I don't deserve the resurrection as Jesus deserved his resurrection. Mm, okay. Now let's go on. You'll, you'll, you'll see where the perfection comes in here in a minute. Boy, that feels funny. But I follow after. Neither, well, it says, neither were already perfect or attained to. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend or reach out and grasp, that for which I am apprehended of Christ. Jesus, on the Damascus road, reached out and grabbed Paul, Saul, by the nape of the neck and tossed him on the ground. Well, if he was riding a horse, some, nobody knows. And blinded him and he, Paul saw this Saul saw this white light and he heard the voice Saul, Saul why are you persecuting me? was he? oh yeah and the strange thing is if you know the story of Paul he thought he was doing God's service the question is was he? <laughs> well, he was sincere about what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. But the first words out of Saul's mouth were, Lord, what do you want me to do? Hmm. Jesus reached out and apprehended him on, on the, the Damascus road. Paul, he says, as I was also apprehended of Christ. Brethren, this is 13, I count not myself to have apprehended, gotten hold of the privilege of the resurrection yet. But, This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. This is the third text, this portion of 13. Forgetting those things which are behind. What do I, what do, I do? 
I reach, I try to apprehend, I keep reaching for that, that, uh, what does it say here? I reach and reaching forth to those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now we end there for the moment. Those of us who are 89, 88, 79, some of you others, 19, you have a better chance than we do. We, uh, listen to me now. We still may be alive when Jesus returns. Amen? Amen? Amen. The way things are going, well, you'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind, dumb and blind to realize that something is going on. So we may be, but if not, what's our greatest hope? The resurrection. Are you reaching forward to the resurrection, hoping for the resurrection? Forgetting those things which are behind. What did Paul have behind in his life? Oh, my brother, my sister, he had everything behind him. Persecution of the saints of God, thinking he was doing God's service. Murder, arresting these people, in some cases killing. Stephen, consenting to his death, stood there arrogantly watching the act of the others approvingly with the clothing at his feet. But Paul was apprehended by Christ. There is no better place to be than being apprehended by Christ. We could be apprehended by the government. We could be apprehended by the, the the Democrats, we, what's even worse perhaps, we could be apprehended by the Republicans. We could be apprehended by the Mormons. Well, I could tell you a few things there too. No, time is up. Isn't it? We could be apprehended by them. We could be apprehended by the Muslims. Good people, wonderful people. Uh, 75% of them. But this is the, the, according to the stats. That means 25%. Well, 25% is only like three, 400 million. And uh, they wait in dark alleys and they throw people off roofs and perish the thought that one of their ladies is raped all of a sudden she becomes the one who is unclean and she must be beheaded or stoned. I, 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 I don't know about you, no, I don't want to throw stones, don't want to throw stones. About 30 years ago, 60 years ago this time, I think I got it right. About 60 years ago, I was at Fort Sam Houston in Texas, going through the medical corps so I could learn to take care of people in the armed services. We uh, decided that we would go to Keene, New, uh, Keene uh, Texas. Uh, anybody know what's in Keene? Okay, yeah, there's a, there's a school up there, isn't there? You know what schools have? Students. Girls. <laughs> I, mean, I haven't, I've, I've never seen a boy's school, but I have never seen a co-ed school without girls. So we went to Keene and we started looking over the crop of girls. Well, this one family took uh, all five of us home for dinner. That was a nice thing to do. 
One of the girls, her name is Carol, she invited me to go out on the backyard on a blanket. Well, don't think of the country version now. Uh, on a blanket for a glass of uh, lemonade. And we went out there and we sat for about two hours drinking the lemonade and talking. And we agreed that we would write to each other. I'm abbreviating this because it's too late. Uh, uh, we we uh, separated then after that and she stopped once at San Antonio. We met in kind of a passing thing, uh, visited, visited for a little bit. And then she was gone to Mexico for a mission trip. I went to Germany, and while I was there, uh, I lost my compass. And uh, one time I came home uh, after losing my compass rather strongly, and, and I wrote Carol a letter. And, and that letter wasn't very good. And about 30 years later, I was on the, the internet with, with a guy by the name, his, his uh, computer uh, handle was Mule Skinner. He was a guy I'd been in the service with at Fort Sam, Fort Sam Houston. And I, uh, there was another guy on there from Keene, and uh, I asked him, uh, Did you, do you know anybody by the name of, uh, I won't mention her name, you might know her, uh, by the name of uh, Jones. And he says, well, yeah, there's a Jones family that used to live here, but they're gone. I don't know where they are. So Mule Skinner comes back on. And he, says, he says, I knew a Carol Jones. I said, yeah, that's the one. And uh, he says, she stood up with us at our wedding. <laughs> you know, it's a small world. It is an absolute... A small world, three degrees of separation or something like that. Uh, I told him the story and he's, I said, Do you, could, you, could you let me know where she is? Because I'd like to uh, write her a note and ask her forgiveness. He said, under the circumstances, I don't see how it would hurt. I wrote her a short note and I said, please, it was at a bad time in my life, forgive me. And she wrote back very, you know what she, you know what she said? She, she wrote back a very nice letter and said, of course, I forgive you. Well, it was about uh, three or four years ago, she uh, uh, contacted me and said, we're going to be in Winter Haven. That's precious close to Avon Park. And now I've got this thing, should I, should I invite her down, meet my wife? And, and she, said, uh, she said, we're planning on visiting the Avon Park Church. Oh! She came. And when they came in, I went in and sat down with her and her husband. Just so you know, we're not getting into anything naughty here. I sat down with her and her husband, his name is Oliver, and she and Oliver came home for dinner. And uh, after dinner, Oliver went to sleep. My wife, with no one to talk to, went back in her computer room and, and got on her computer. Carol and I sat at our dining room table, and I looked at her, and once again, tears, brimming this time, ready to fall. And she said, what was in the letter? Well, you know what's going through my mind now? Didn't you read the letter I sent you? <laughs> and I didn't say anything. I said, I, I said finally, uh, it was rather suggestive. And she says, oh. She said, Dan, I never got the letter. At that point, uh, I confess, I could have kicked myself from here to, to Orlando, maybe further and back. 
I was forgiven from the bottom of her heart she forgave. It was battered and scarred and the auctioneer thought it was scarcely worth his while to waste much time with that old violin but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two, two dollars, and who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three? But no, from the room, from the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. And wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer with a voice that was quiet and low said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars, and who'll make it two? Two thousand, and who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going, gone, said he. The people cheered. Some of them cried, we don't understand. What changed its worth? Swift came the reply. The touch of the master's hand, whisper again. So many a man with life out of tune, battered and scarred with sin, is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone, but the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Amen. We're ready to stand and sing our closing song, number 300, Rock of Ages.
our gracious Father in heaven, you have shown your grace in so many ways. And I'm reminded once again of the song that you must have inspired. Were it not for grace, I can tell where I would be, wandering down some path to nowhere with my salvation up to me. Thank you for your forgiveness, for your honesty, fairness, and assurance that you will forgive to the uttermost those who come to you in faith, confessing. We thank you for being with us. We pray your presence and the power of your Holy Spirit go with each one here today, tomorrow, throughout the week, and in every day until Jesus returns. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.